At the turn of the 20th century, the harbor of New York City saw the immigration of thousands of disenfranchised Italians. The poor and the downtrodden, most of them searching for a slice of the American dream that they will never find. Among these masses of mediocrity, one 15-year-old boy will stand out among the crowd in one of the most legendary criminal careers ever imagined. His relentless quest for respect and power will take him from the slum streets of Little Italy and Manhattan to the top of the Cosa Nostra. He will rise among the ranks with the likes of Lucky Luciano, Frank Costello, and Albert Anastasia, while eventually expanding his outlaw portfolio to include bootlegging, numbers rackets, and even a collaboration with the Benito Mussolini regime. His specialty, however, and his legacy, will be built on his strongest suit, cold-blooded murder. This is the legend of Vito Don Vitone Genovese. I wouldn't know a gunman if I saw one. Gangster era stuff. Five feuds of public enemies bring a reign of terror and baffle police. How did this famous gangster treat you? He treated me wonderful. This is what I'm telling you, what I'm exposing. This is my do, 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 do. We were talking about how the five families, when they got busted, they were under the RICO Act. None of them knew what the hell RICO was, and that was the big chatter between them and stuff. And they're like, what's this RICO, RICO? And we were just imagining that uh, there just happened to be this hot dog vendor down on the corner named RICO, and the guys are all standing outside the butcher shop looking at him, and the poor son of a bitch is about to get killed. They're just like, yeah, there he is. And that was the inside joke. It was no big deal, but... uh, yeah, I kind of brought you guys in on the end of it, and I guess uh, it confused some people, and most of you just didn't care. Tonight, Vito Genovese, when I was listening to him, I heard a lot of cops talking about it. The words like sociopath and psychopath, homicidal maniac. Endearing terms. Yeah, and I think a lot of it's just hype when you do the uh, documentaries and stuff, because if you're getting into that and you're hearing he's one of the most degenerate gangsters to ever hit the streets of New York, you're like, holy crap, I'm in for a show. It's a good show, but he's not Anastasia, wouldn't you say? I, just, I hate it when those guys just get lumped together. Like, yeah, they're all they're all doing shady stuff, but, like, this guy doesn't compare to... Vito doesn't compare to Albert. Not at all. Or, or not even Carmine. No, Doug. he's yeah, he's no Carmine Galani. He's Vito's no, not going to uh, pull a gonorrhea-soaked rag out of his suitcase and put it over a guy's eyes. And, and he's no uh, Bugsy Siegel. Not that he's less than or less of a man or less of a gangster than these guys, but yeah. when you're going to talk about pure killing numbers... Yeah. I don't think he has it. No, he doesn't. Yeah. So, it's got to be Albert, you think? I think it has to be, so far. Yeah. Right? Now, we got other guys like Richard Kuklinski and stuff that we'll get into, if you consider him a gangster. But uh, they, yeah. they, they, maybe he's up there. But yeah, Anastasia with Murder Incorporated and uh, even Kid Twist, I'd say. Would Kid Twist Relis. Dwarf. He would dwarf Vito Genovese yeah. in, in murders. Not that it's a competition, it's just a conversation, <laughs> right? So you keep hearing like, oh, he was a complete sociopath and all that. And I'm Slow like, oh, that, that's like the dime store word these days, you know? Yeah. And uh, who's not called a sociopath these days? You know, we just use it, I think, frivolously. And I don't think most people know what it means. And like, I get called a sociopath at least three times a year or I'm doing something wrong, <laughs> right? So to prove that I wasn't a sociopath... I looked it up, and uh, the uh, definitive psychological website, Healthline.com. So <laughs> I, uh, I'm in a hurry. So here's, uh, here's the g- general Same gist of this. <laughs> this is practically the Oracle at Delphi. <clears throat> what is a sociopath? A sociopath is a term used to describe someone who has antisocial personality disorder, or as we will refer to it, ASPD. People with ASPD can't understand others' feelings. They'll often break rules or make impulsive decisions without feeling guilty for the harm they cause. People with ASPD may also use mind games to control friends, family members, co-workers, and even strangers. They may also be perceived as charismatic or charming. How is someone diagnosed as a sociopath? ASPD is part of a category of personality disorders characterized by persistent negative behaviors. 
the new edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or you probably all know it as the DSM-5, says that someone with ASPD consistently shows a lack of regard for others' feelings or violations of people's rights. People with ASPD may not realize that they have these behaviors. They may live their entire lives without a diagnosis. To receive a diagnosis of the ASPD, someone must be older than 18. Their behaviors must show a pattern of at least three of the following seven traits. Number one, doesn't respect social norms or laws. Check. They they consistently break laws or overstep social boundaries. Check. Okay, stop. Don't check anymore. I don't know, he's killing me. (laughs) Number three, doesn't make any long-term plans. They also often behave without thinking of consequences. Number four, shows aggressive or aggravated behavior. They constantly get into fights or physically harm others. Number five, doesn't consider their own safety or the safety of others. Number six, doesn't follow up on personal or professional responsibilities. This can include repeatedly being late to work or not paying bills on time. Number seven, doesn't feel guilt or remorse for having harmed or mistreated others. So three of the seven and you're a sociopath. So how many sociopaths we got in the room? Uh. Yeah, everybody's a sociopath. If we're honest. Yeah, if we're honest. And that was the thing is like, I set this out to concretely prove that I'm not a sociopath. <laughs> and I start reliefing through the pages. I'm like, well, shit. <laughs> six out of seven. <laughs> yeah, six out of seven. I do show up for work. And, and if the seven doesn't catch the entire population of America, they added a few other possible symptoms, right? Being cold by not showing emotions or investment in the lives of others. Using humor, intelligence, or charisma to manipulate others. That's sales, right? Having a sense of superiority and a strong, unwavering opinions. Not learning from mistakes. Not being able to keep positive friendships or relationships. Attending to control others by intimidating or threatening them. Getting into frequent legal trouble or performing criminal acts. Taking risks at the expense of themselves or others. Threatening suicide without ever acting on these threats. Becoming addicted to drugs, alcohol, or other substances. So basically, when you hear that a mobster or a gangster is a sociopath, yeah, you need that to get in the club. You're not even going to be a low-level associate. If you're not a sociopath. Okay, so of everybody we've covered, who do you think defines uh, or would personify sociopath the most? I gotta say Bugsy Siegel. He could have walked away and never gotten his hands dirty, but he just wants to go in there and see how many people he can get on his death list. You're right, he had that, and he didn't seem to weigh the consequences of his actions. I would throw out Dutch Schultz. I was gonna say, Bugsy or Dutch Schultz? I think Bugsy had some kind of a plan. He, he knew what he liked. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But Dutch Schultz, just off the cuff, man, it seemed like he would just do whatever he want without ever thinking of the consequences. And I would argue Anastasia, same. Yeah. Yeah, you know I mean, when he uh, saw the guy on TV and just killed him. <laughs> that's, that's a little yeah. sociopathic there. He's the one that came to my mind. He didn't think it through. Yeah. And I think he's a guy that would have never, ever gotten the okay on a hit. If he wasn't just completely off the rails and unable to uh, think things through. How about Tony Ducks? Definitely not. I think he's the uh, least homicidal person we've covered. Not that he's incapable of murder. He can do it. He can do it. Yeah. (laughs) But I don't think it was like something that that's not a path he wanted to go down. Yeah. Yeah. No, he was more of the business guy. Yeah, and though he had to use physical force and brutal intimidation to get you to comply, I think he would have been just as happy if you could have done it, you know, yep. all the way from the beginning, just done it the right way. He's like, why did we have to do all this, yeah. you know? Yeah. Look, if, even with the uh, trash guys, the leeway he gave them, the years before the hit went down, Yeah, you know? Yep. It was like, because people were like, ah, oh, it sucks what happened to him. I'm like, it does suck, and don't get me wrong, it sucks. But they had every chance, you know, to not let that happen. (laughs) And part of it is they trusted the cops, and I don't want to beat that to death. But like I said, I feel like uh, the Lucchese family gives you more leeway than anyone, you know, and you can't mistake that for weakness. But how do you think the Bonanos would have handled that? Yeah, that that would have been dealt with quickly. Two days. Yeah. Yeah, you'd have two days. The Gambinos, I think, same way. Joe the Boss? Sociopath? Uh, Yeah, I gotta say, yeah. Yeah. He had other problems. <laughs> yeah, he did. But that was one of them. 
Yeah, he had a lot of problems. Carmine? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, Carmine's a... Uh, Forget about know? Carmine sometimes because we did him first. We did him first and it seems like a million years ago, yeah. but what a great story that was. Yeah, that was you great. Know? All right, welcome back. This is Partners in Crime. I am your host, Bill Crooks. A lot of people call me Gunner. And to my right, spinning the gangster stories like a hand-tossed pizza, it is Zach the Zip Griffith. Oh, yeah. Great to be back. Great to be talking about uh, probably the most important gangster we've talked about so far. And as always, across the table, his addiction to movies is surpassed only by his consumption of estrogen pills. It's the Sultan of the Silver Screen, Brett Sexton. Hi. (laughs) And sadly, for his off-color comments last week, hanging by his thumbs in the newly defurbished Partners in Crime root cellar, Joshua, the wise-ass intern. We got rules, Joshua. We got rules. (laughs) Shut up down there. What got into him last week? (laughs) I was wondering when I was listening. We, you know, we are largely unscripted. I'll give you that. But... (laughs) There are freaking rules, and and rules are that the uh, intern doesn't slam the host in a threatening (laughs) manner. And uh, we're going to have to rework that whole uh, scene. I think he'll learn his lesson. Now, since he's hanging by his thumbs, he's never going to be able to work again. No. And there'll be a consequence for that, because you don't put up (laughs) with lazy people around here. Okay, but in uh, full disclosure, that is not Brett Sexton, if you didn't figure that out. (laughs) It is a guest. Brett is... uh, What is Brett doing? He's in some undisclosed location. He went to Chicago. He's hit the big time this week for his internship. He's uh, filming a short film, I think it is. So it's Chicago, so it's got to be illegal. So what what is today? Is it October 1st? Who had October 1st for Brett finally doing a snuff film? (laughs) (laughs) Intern, we're going to have you look that up in the pool. But it, like I said, in full disclosure, that's not Brett. It is my sister standing in, Anne-Marie Giuliano. Say hello. Hello. Good to be here. And uh, she's going to help us out tonight. It's going to be just fine. Don't worry. All right. Let's get started. Vito Genovese is born on November 21st, 1897 in Rossigliano Tufino, a town in the Naples province of Italy. His parents, Francis Felice Genovese and Nunziata Aluato, together have four children, Vito, sons Michael and Carmine, and daughter Giovanna Genie. In 1913, the Genovese clan moves to New York City, one of the thousands of Italian immigrant families of his time. As it turns out, Vito is not the only member of the family to make a name for himself in American organized crime. His cousin Michael will eventually be named the boss of the Pittsburgh crime family. While in Italy, Genovese only managed to ascend to the American equivalent of fifth grade. Upon arriving in the big city at age 15, Vito is immediately disenchanted with the city slum version of the American dream. He sees the way a hardworking, honest man is resigned to a life of relative poverty and wants no part of it. While shacking up in the Little Italy neighborhood of Manhattan, Genovese begins his criminal escapades. Running simple errands for some of the most violent mobsters of his era and thieving merchandise from local pushcart vendors, young Vito gains enough respect from the upper levels of crime to be trusted with collecting money from people playing the illegal lotteries. At age 19, Genovese is arrested for the first time on a charge of illegal possession of a firearm. So he was apparently accosted by police for whatever reason. They searched him, and what they find is a loaded revolver tucked in his waistband. So he's already heavily into the game by this point. And uh, I've watched a bunch of stuff on him and read some stuff. It seems like he killed a couple people already, at least one. You know, but they keep saying he killed a hoodlum and stuff. And I don't. I wonder if they don't confuse that with the card game thing that we'll get into later. So I'm not sure if it was two legitimate kills. They have no information on who it is or anything like that, or, you know, I'd bring it up. But it seems like he's already had a couple run-ins like that. He's making a name for himself. So then he's got the loader revolver in his pants, and that's his first real documented uh, arrest. 19 might not have been considered young back then like it is now. But right. True. Killed two guys by 19. But Anastasia was on death row at 17. So he's an amateur. (laughs) 
When the early 1920s roll around, Genovese gets into business with Joe the Boss Masseria, boss of a powerful Manhattan gang that will eventually wear the name Genovese. Gradually, with help from Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello, Genovese assists in operating a successful bootlegging operation with financial aid from Arnold Rothstein, the gambling kingpin behind the Black Sox scandal and a man looking to make a profit during the Prohibition era. So I got a good story for this. The first time Costello introduces Genovese to Lancey and Siegel as their partners in various enterprises, Genovese says, What are you trying to do, load us up with a bunch of heaps? <laughs> and Costello snaps back, like, Take it easy, Don Vuitton. You're nothing but an effing foreigner yourself. So it seems like uh, there, was a, there was a bit of uh, early cultural... Uh, what do you want to say, cultural integration problems with a lot of the gangs. Like we always kind of take for granted that these are the guys that were the pioneers of, uh, you know, uh, the end of the Sicilian era and stuff. But uh, there's plenty of racism to go around as Masseria doesn't like Costello and Genovese. He doesn't like them that well because they're not Sicilian. They're from uh, Calabria and Naples, respectively, and uh, he tolerates them for Luciano as they're Italians, but he declares openly that they will never rise above the rank of soldier. So even the Italians from the northern parts of Italy, they're out. Just not a good business plan. It's it's really a tough tough thing but you got to remember when these guys come over they are ostracized and segregated and uh you don't think of italians being um like discriminated against as heavily but they really were there'll be signs in a window in new york city that says we don't serve italians you know so they're not considered white people and they're not they're not accepted at all so uh they're they're looped in with uh, the sicilians who are the same way and between italians and sicilians there's a big difference yeah. to them you know, to everybody else, they're all just Italians, right? They mostly stick to Little Italy because of what you said, the signs in the windows and stuff. Like right. we saw in Godfather 2. Like, if you're Italian, you're in Little Italy. Just like uh, Meyer Lansky and those guys were stuck over in the Jewish neighborhood and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Till Luciano poked his head over there and tried to shake him down. <laughs> Much yeah. like Columbus coming to the New World <laughs> and shaking down the Native Americans. This This... Vito Genovese story is going to tie a lot of our stories together. This is like the thread that's going to weave all our different episodes. Yeah. And, you already and heard Joe it, the Boss's name. And make it the beautiful tapestry that it was meant to be. <laughs> so at this point, you got to remember, Genovese was involved in the shooting of Umberto Valente beside Luciano in the Masseria episode. Like when uh, he was getting away down that car. Uh, yeah. We could probably pull that up. Suddenly, both sides start shooting at each other as the Duke Valenti tries to make his escape. Despite the hail of gunfire directed his way, he manages to make it outside. Still dodging bullets, he leaps on the running boards of a passing car. In the street, an eight-year-old girl is playing outside her grandfather's store near a road sweeper performing his duties. The gangsters pay them no mind, and the girl is shot in the chest. The road sweeper falls back into a gutter and is also seriously injured. Valenti gets fairly far down the street and it looks like he will make his getaway, but one lone gunman stands calm and gets off one more carefully aimed shot. Only seconds away from a narrow escape, the man called the ghost becomes a real ghost as he is struck in the chest and falls dead. The calm assassin is reported to be a young man by the name of Charlie Luciano who has brought along his up-and-comer gunman pal, Vito Genovese. Yeah, you remember that. Yeah. Okay, so Lucky got that shot in. Vito was right by his side, and Vito had been introduced to Masseria by Luciano at this point. In 1930, when police stumble upon a measly $1 million in counterfeit bills, Genovese is brought in and indicted on the charges. Later that year, Joe the Boss Masseria begins to suspect that old Tom Reyna is helping his arch rival, Salvatore Maranzano. Joe's response, he allegedly sends the young Genovese to carry out the hit on Reyna. So Maranzano's in town now. He's been ousted from Sicily by Mussolini, who despises the Sicilian mafia. And uh, Mussolini is hunting him down and killing him. And we've covered this a little bit, but I'm not sure to what detail. Like, we've actually thrown it in. So Masseria is coming here, not just because he was a successful mafioso, which he was, 
but he's also on the run, and he figures America is the land of opportunity. He knows there's some Italian gangs and things happening, but he figures they're going to be weak yeah. compared to the things he's used to, and uh, he's right. You know, it's it's relatively easy. His only obstacle is Masseria. Yep. Like, and no matter how tough you are, there's always some other douchebag that's in the way of what you want. Like, no matter how good you are, there's one guy yeah. that just gets in your crawl. And uh, with Genovese, we're going to find that one guy changes, but the one guy is always there <laughs> that gets in his way. Usually not in his way for too long. One great story, this guy met Maranzano when he was like two weeks in New York. So he's coming in, and he's putting his posse and stuff together. you got to see this guy, right? So he's like, all right, so we'll meet this guy. He said he goes into this room, and it's kind of dark. And he's sitting in a chair. He's got his leather jacket on and his hat's down over his eyes. It reminds me of that show Fargo that's on now, right? But he says, Masseria has two pistols tucked in the waistband of the front of his pants. He's looking at him real intent. And there's 90 guys standing behind him. And every single one of them is armed to the teeth. And that's how you meet Maranzano. (laughs) But it was just like, just hearing it, you know, hearing about a guy that had said it a long time ago. I'm like... You just, it really painted the scene and what a badass, you know? And uh, we will get to him. You know? Oh, yeah. But, but uh, Maranzano is uh, just, uh, just a beautiful figure in uh, gangland lore, in my opinion. On February 26, 1930, most likely with some false pretense of working late, Reyna is creeping out of his mistress's home in the Bronx. Intercepted somewhere between his lover and his next appointment, Reyna soon wishes he actually had been working late this night when his skull is rearranged by a Genovese shotgun blast to the back of his head. In early 1931, Vito finds himself right in the throes of the Castellamarese War, an epic mob conflict between the Masseria and Maranzano factions. Engineering a backdoor deal with Maranzano, Lucky Luciano plans the hit on Joe the Boss in exchange for Masseria's rackets and being named Maranzano's second-in-command. On April 15, 1931, Luciano lures Masseria to the Nuova Villa Tomorrow on Coney Island. Enjoying a nice game of cards, Lucky excuses himself to the bathroom, only to be replaced at the table by some of the most legendary killers of the era. Vito Genovese, Albert Anastasia, Joe Adonis, and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. Needless to say, Masseria doesn't cash in on his winnings this time around. I can't even imagine those four guys walking in for a hit. It is. It's like Zach said earlier, the dream team. But the thing is, too, you're thinking about it in hindsight. You know, Masseria, two of them are Jewish, right? He yep. doesn't even know who they are. Yep. And I'm sure he had no respect. I'm sure he just looked up indignantly like, who the hell are you? How do you, know? you not know who the main hitmen are? Because they were nobody back then. They were still young. Those guys weren't popular. Siegel was just making a name. And this is one of the things that put Siegel, Anastasia, and these guys on the map. Plus, Jewish gangs and Italian gangs don't associate with each other, right? By mastery his own decree. So he doesn't know the face of his killers when they come in. So he doesn't know these guys. And that's the way they operate a lot of times. They bring in strangers yeah, to that's, do the hits. That was the beautiful yeah. thing about Murder Incorporated. Half Italian, half Jewish. If you got an Italian hit, you bring in the Jewish guys. Because when you're in an Italian war, you're looking for an Italian guy sneaking up on yep. you. The Jews, they all look the same. He doesn't doesn't know they are. Same way with the Jews. The Italians come in. And they all look the same. Totally off the radar. Yeah, they don't deal together. They don't intermingle. And... And it's also, uh, we kind of covered this in Anastasia, right? When the police are trying to figure this out, the hitmen have absolutely no connection to these guys whatsoever. So there's no, any, you know, the usual list of suspects, they all have alibis. So it's just a trick that they started early That's on. That's brilliant. If you haven't heard the Masseria episode, you should go back. But uh, we'll play you a little clip. The, the Masseria assassination went a little something like this. At some point, Lucky Luciano excuses himself to the restroom. It's the signal for the gunmen to make their advance. The hit is executed by professionals, and there will be no dodging bullets today as they charge through the front door, guns blazing. Joe has time to stand up, but he's an easy target at such close range. Two 38 caliber rounds are fired into his back immediately. Still, he manages to get to his feet. The assault continues at point blank range, only inches away, the next two shots so close that they spray his light gray jacket with a smudge of gunpowder. The next bullets burn through his ample body, piercing his heart, lungs, and liver, 
literally tearing them apart and exiting his torso. One final shot is delivered to the back of his head, shredding his brain and blowing his eye right out of its socket. Joe the Boss Masseria is dead before his bulk hits the hard wooden floor. Yeah, it was, it was great fun. But that, that's what I was going to say. It's all part of the tactic. Catch him by surprise. Use these four guys never seen their faces. Not the faces I would choose to be the last ones I saw. No, no. And uh, it's like you said, this is such a weird culture. I think today it, it's hard to even imagine living every single day yeah. with the threat of murder. At the same time, you got to remember little Tony Ducks. Yep. Yep. <laughs> He's that little rascal's uh, running around too. <laughs> Legend has it that Siegel has to shove getaway driver Ciro, the artichoke king Terra Nova, out of the driver's seat because he's too shaken up by the violence adjacent to Luciano's potty break. Upon Masseria's death, Luciano takes over the family and names Genovese as his trusted underboss. Vito Genovese is Luciano's favorite hitman, even over Anastasia. He had said that uh, Vito was not only a efficient hitman, but Anastasia was too much of a hothead. Vito apparently had the discipline, you know, which also flies in the face that he's just this reckless homicidal maniac it's that everybody true. wants to portray him as. Yeah. yeah. And Luciano used him, at least at this point in his career, because he followed orders. He knew the plan. He didn't go rogue. You know, he's yeah. not going to kill somebody because he saw him on television. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. and he got mad, that kind of stuff. So he was actually, uh, he was Luciano's right hand man for a, a long, long time. Wonder if uh, that rubbed Albert the wrong way, you know? Got stepped over. Did he notice? He might have been too dumb to notice, yeah. Or too self-absorbed. Yeah. Well, I don't think at the time uh, Anastasia really had. You know, he's come off death row. Right? Yeah. He owes Anastasia. Like you said, age seventeen. Yeah, he owes Luciano everything. Because yeah. Luciano got him off death row. He's just working, and he's just killing people. So you Luciano know? And, doesn't owe him anything. He don't, oh, God, no. He yeah, doesn't no. nothing. No. And he's just a tool of revenge for Luciano. And uh, like I said, like Anastasia, it's just like, hey, go kill that guy. Okay. Yeah. He just goes and kills him. He That's what he did. That was his thing. I don't think he, at least at this point, had his eyes on any kind of leadership position. He was just making money. And he was already resigned to the electric chair. Yeah. So it's all just gravy at this point. I don't think he gets into any kind of uh, long-term career planning until the dissolution of Murder Incorporated. Yeah. After the, before that, he's just he's just a working stiff, living the dream. How about uh, Ciro Terranova? How do you get a nickname like that? The Artichoke King. Um, it's kind of odd. He gets his name because he began purchasing all the artichokes that came into New York and selling them for roughly three times more so artichokes are a hot commodity yeah N- nobody's growing them you know in the hood so yeah. the italians it's a, it's a heavy ingredient in northern italian dishes so it's it's well thought of you want an artichoke you gotta come to me <laughs> or i choke you <laughs> but he, he created his own supply and demand right yeah and i bet he used that crazy artichoke line and he made everybody like out of choke you. No, I'm just kidding. There you go. You get three. Somebody else comes up. I'd like some. Yeah, out of choke you. <laughs> oh, you get four. You really laughed at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the more you laugh at his crazy one liner, then the, the, the more, more choke you get. Yeah. Not wasting any time after Masseria's demise, Genovese and Luciano plan the death of Maranzano in September 1931. Maranzano is scheduling the deaths of Genovese and Luciano, but should have pushed it up a couple days because the duo prepare a firing squad of four Jewish gangsters before he gets a chance to strike. On September 10th, 1931, when Maranzano summons Luciano, Genovese, and Frank Costello to a meeting in his office, they realize the odds of Maranzano taking a Luciano-style restroom break are pretty solid. The preemptive hit team, supplied by Lansky and Siegel, are completely unknown to Maranzano and his people. Posing as federal agents, they see that Maranzano is eliminated. So if you recall, that was the Bugsy Siegel episode, and uh, the murder went just a little bit like this. Now, this is the famous hit where Bugsy and company disguise themselves as federal agents, and Maranzano right now is going through some tax evasion stuff, 
So he's expecting some federal interference, and he's he's telling all his guys like, "Play it cool. Don't have any weapons in the office," because <laughs> they're expecting like the tip they're getting, which might have been fed by Luciano, is that this this raid is coming. So they're ready, right? So when these guys come in, they're all like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do what you got to do." They get their hands up on the wall, and these guys just start stabbing. Their hands <laughs> out. Like, Walked they, right into it. Yep. Uh, and he was yeah happily you know and we'll see that kind of trick again in the future but that's what that's where it went down after the hit luciano sets up the famed commission to rule over organized crime in the city the next two years of genovese's love life are very eventful in 1931 vito's wife donata ragoni passes away of tuberculosis like a champ the future mob boss shakes it off by brazenly announcing his intention to wed anna patillo with just one problem. Patillo is married to Gerard Vernatico, a local Little Italy banker who had nothing, according to Kate Harmon, Genovese's grandniece. Put yourself in the shoes of Gerard here. Well, uh, you know, I'm going to hope that Gerard understands <laughs> and he backs off. Not, like, a, not a chance. <laughs> he just looks at his wife. Well, oh, shit. <laughs> Puts on his hat. And he uh, walks out the door. Is that how it goes down? I don't no. think so. I don't think so. <laughs> it can be assumed that Gerard the Baker is not open to a change in his marital status and decides to push back. On March 16, 1932, Vernatico is lured to a Manhattan rooftop and confronted by Genovese. Why, why are you going to a rooftop? Why? They're just going to talk. <laughs> well, yeah, why not? There wasn't any air conditioning at that point. Oh, that's a good point. It's a private place to have a conversation. <laughs> There's nothing wrong here, Zach. You are so suspicious. Until you see Vito. You're so suspicious. <laughs> I don't know. Who hurt you? <laughs> the stories we've read so far have hurt me. should have hurt him. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably, he's given the news that his marriage is over, but is unwilling to see the writing on the wall. As gentlemanly negotiations deteriorate, Gerard the Baker ah. is severely beaten. Ah. Unsatisfied, Vito Genovese attacks from behind and wraps some manner of cord around his neck, brutally squeezing the life from his body. Tongue swelling, his eyes bulging as the capillaries within them burst into dark spots of crimson, the last sound Vernatico hears will be the crushing of his own windpipe. In the end, Vernatico loses not only his wife, but also his life. Twelve days later, Vito and Anna who is Genovese's cousin through her mother. First cousin. Not like third once removed. Cousin. He tried to kind of downplay it. They go, isn't that your cousin? He goes, ah, through my mother. (laughs) Like, people think about it. They go, yeah, cousin. (laughs) No, it's my mother's sister's kid. (laughs) Uh, So they're happily married. So she's six months pregnant, and apparently the family didn't like Gerard. They never did. Mm-hmm. And uh, make no mistake, she's from a mob family. Right. She's not like uh, Anastasia's wife or somebody that came from the outside and didn't know. And I want you to bear this in mind as we progress in the story. Her cousin is also the leader of the Pittsburgh crime family, right? This, this shit is deep, okay? She marries him pretty quickly, so you got to assume she didn't have a lot of objections to Gerard getting killed. And there's also some discrepancies. It says a lot that he was found on the roof tip with a crushed wooden pipe, that he was strangled, all this stuff. There's also a lot of documentaries that talk about Vito Genovese throwing him off the roof of the building. So I, I can't say for certain that that happened. My inclination is to believe that he was strangled and left for dead on the roof. However, if he did throw him off the building, it probably would have sounded like this. Ah! Yeah, and that's how that would have gone down. There's also uh, Genovese's first wife. Okay? The, the storyline is that she died of tuberculosis. And I kind of took that at face value. But then somewhere there were threads of suspicions about that. And uh, maybe she did die of tuberculosis. But I think if I'm not a doctor or anything, you know, but usually when you die of tuberculosis, your body is still left behind. And apparently her body was never found. So the story of her dying of tuberculosis may not be true. He may have just made her disappear, too. So I'm guessing an affair between these two went on first. And she's like, oh, but you're married. Married and I'm married. He's like, I can fix all that. You know, like, hey, she died. And he actually did wait a, a grieving period. I want to say it was a six month period of mourning. She got, what, 11 days or something? People mourn in different ways. Yeah. You know, yeah. she, she mourns by marrying her cousin. 
Well, I think just, I have a feeling that she maybe orchestrated the death of his wife and her own husband. Uh, I have no doubt she had something to do with it. Yeah. I mean, like Bill said, she she was no stranger to the mob anyway. So. Right. There was another guy murdered, Antonio Lonzo was murdered with Gerard because he had been with him and witnessed the, the first murder. So it wasn't just him that got strangled and, uh, oh, man. and thrown off the building or whatever. His buddy was with him or something, and he got killed too. And it really kind of sucks. Like, I was killed too, you know, and yeah. then Gerard lives on in the annals of history. And uh, this guy's only mentioned because I you know, stayed up till 11 o'clock last night trying to find anybody else that died. I wonder if, because uh, Gerard's a baker, I'm willing to bet Vito or somebody, Vito's boss, has their hands on that bakery. You know? Oh, took it over? Yeah. It's possible. Uh, but they can sit but out wouldn't front. her family have already been in on that bakery? And Vito probably wouldn't have taken it if they were in the mob. If he didn't have any money, I can't imagine anybody wanted the bakery. Yeah. Yeah, but you could sit out front of the bakery and like talk about Rico, the hot dog vendor and stuff. Yeah. Italian guys like to sit out front of stores, and bakeries is as good as anything. And you can get cannoli anywhere. Yeah. Oh, cannoli. Cannoli, That's yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Of course, of course they took the bakery. Now I feel like a child. <laughs> Got their hands on the cannoli, too. And some good pizzelles. But, like, I'm trying to figure out how Vito decided. He just, I think he was in love with her. They were related, so he knew her. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that, yeah. You know how it is, you haven't seen your cousin in a few years, and then she shows <laughs> up and you marry her. Come on, Zach, what are you talking about? I wonder how she ended up marrying the poor ass baker in the first place, you know what I mean? Her choices were limited. There was the butcher, the baker, and then you're not going to marry the candlestick baker. What kind of, what kind of life is that going to be? So the happy ending is they do get married in a church ceremony in Greenwich Village, Manhattan. After the Castello Marese War ends in 1931, Genovese has accumulated considerable power and influence in the New York rackets. In 1934, Vito is escalated from the one carrying out hits to the one ordering them. I heard at the end of the war, uh, Genevieve dressed up like a sailor and bent his sister over and laid a big kiss on her like that. Uh, no, he didn't do that. <laughs> You're going to hell. <laughs> Genevieve and fellow mobster Ferdinand Bochia conspired to con a local big-time gambler out of 150 grand in a high-stakes poker game. After successfully pulling off the swindle, Bochia has the balls to ask Genovese for a take of 35000 for introducing Vito to the mark. Vito briefly weighs his options and ultimately decides that he would be happier with the money. On September 19, 1934, Ferdinand is enjoying a nice cup of joe at a Brooklyn cafe. Ferdinand soon finds that his coffee won't be the only hot thing pouring into his stomach that day, as Genovese and five associates blast hot lead into Bochia, putting him away for good. So there's other reports that it wasn't so much about the money. That's kind of like the, the main story or legend is that he, he, he didn't just want to pay him the 35 grand. But there's other uh, things that say Genovese regarded him as a weak link. I don't know the nature of this guy, but he's like, if somebody's going to squeal, if somebody's going to break, it's going to be this guy. And that's why he did it, right? And it's really a shame because he had the nickname The Shadow. <laughs> and I'm like, what a, I would kill him for the nickname. Yeah. Perfect. If you're the shadow, you gotta you gotta walk tall. You yeah. Know? You got lucky with the nickname. Like Gunner. No. Or, or the meat hook. <laughs> two two nicknames I've been known to have. You know, as we'll find out later, uh he probably should have just given old Ferdinand the money. Yeah, it's he probably was a little greedy. Yeah. <laughs> if that's why. In nineteen thirty six, after Luciano learns the hard way that Big Pimpin' ain't easy, he finds himself in the crosshairs of the famous Thomas Dewey, having turned his sights on Lucky after his elimination of Dutch Schultz, which was designed to avoid unnecessary attention from law enforcement. Go figure. With Luciano out of the picture, Vito Genovese considers himself the heir apparent. But a funny thing happens on the way to the commission. Dewey sets his sights immediately on Genovese for the killing of Bochia. Seems no one wants to let that go. A low-level hood named Peter Latempa has gotten himself in some sort of pinch and is leveraging the Bochia murder for a lighter sentence. Essentially, Latempa is pressured to support the testimony of hitman Ernest the Hawk Rapolo in the government's case against Vito. Shortly after Genovese's escape to Sicily, Latempa reportedly agrees to cooperate with the authorities because he believes that Genovese will never be prosecuted. 
Latempa alleges that he overheard Genovese planning the execution. Yeah, nobody's expecting to see Genovese again, and Genovese has got the worst freaking luck. It's 1937, right? Everybody's forgotten about this thing. Freaking body washes up. It's Bochia. It's 1937. (laughs) Gotta be kidding me. Guess who's home for dinner? (laughs) (laughs) That amazes me. Yeah. I mean, truly, somebody screwed up when they were sending him to sleep with the fishes. Somebody got killed for that. Well, yeah, but, I mean, you weighed him down with chains and stuff, and that's all good until his arms and legs start falling off. And I'm sure he wasn't intact when he floated up. But, I mean, you got to... Take him out of the middle of nowhere. Yeah, you got to. And uh, wasn't it... If you're a mobster, wouldn't you just... They own everything, right? Just buy a funeral home and bury these guys. (laughs) You're going to bury a guy? Just a two-man coffin, right? You just throw another one in there. I understand why more people aren't cremated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, back then especially. Now there's a... Right, but yeah. it's it's not as easy as you think because there's records of the gas that you use and the energy that a crematorium takes and stuff, and there's there's records and logs. So if like you burn three bodies, but you use the energy of eight bodies. Oh, gotcha. Oh yeah, there was something going on like that. It was a few years back, but what they were finding was they were dismembering, and they owned a crematorium, but they were still burying heads in the grass and in the yard and sticking them all over, cut the place and stuff, because I think there's regulation that makes it not as easy as you think to just burn people alive. Well, how about back then? I'm glad you've researched. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a dead end, Re, give it up. <laughs> how about back then, like, buy off a construction crew, mix them in with the cement? But they always find them. I wouldn't go looking under any of Anne Marie's sidewalks. That's what no. I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> there's a reason our driveway was extended out of four feet on you the You got, side. like, an eight-foot sidewalk across your yard. It's a big yard, but still, that seems like... Everybody else's is like three foot. (laughs) Right on the heels of becoming a naturalized U.S. citizen in November 1936 and having just anointed himself the new boss, Genovese is forced to flee to Nola, an Italian town near Naples, with 750 grand cash and a trunk. In his stead, Frank Costello leads the Luciano family. Like I said, there's always another guy in the way, and now it's going to be Costello. Uh, Costello's come up. Uh, he was a rough-and-tumble guy with Genovese back in the day, and somehow he comes out of prison and all the better for it. He realizes that uh, the violent way is going to end badly for him, and he becomes the smart gangster. Uh, his first move is uh, slot machines. He's known as King of the Slots, and he's bringing in like half a million dollars a day in slots or something. It's ridiculous. So he's get the money and the power. He just passes up Genovese and Genovese can get things you know with the with shooting people and with a gun and Costello can do it with his brain and stuff we'll get into him later I don't want to cover him too much but uh, he owns judges lawyers he's he's got all the power and wealth and like anything Genovese can do with intimidation he can do because people just want to do it for him and so he he rises to the top and quickly becomes Luciano's favorite and he's making everybody just a ton of money After leaving his crime family in New York City behind, Genovese decides to get in on the Mussolini family in Italy. Vito goes as far as befriending Galeazzo Ciana, the son-in-law of Mussolini himself. The friendship is a typical one, with Genovese providing Ciano some much-needed cocaine to get through these trying times in Italian history. By the end of World War II, Vito had become quite the political philanthropist. It is said that Genovese donated as much as $4 million to the fascist party led by Mussolini. The Italian leaders are so fond of Genovese that he is awarded the Order of Saints Maurice and Lazarus, a Catholic knighthood, and made a commendatory, or commander, after aiding the fascist efforts in Nola by creating a new headquarters there. In 1943, Genovese orders the killing of Carlo Tresca, an anti-fascist newspaper publisher in New York and a known enemy of Mussolini's. Willing to carry out the murder as a favor to the good old boys back home, Genovese hires none other than Carmine the Cigar Galani to execute the hit. On January 11, 1943, Tresca is brutally gunned down outside his Manhattan publishing office. So we covered that in the Galani episode, if you don't remember. Uh, it kind of went down like this. I think at 9.45 p.m., Tresca and a friend cross to the corner of 5th Avenue. Galani, dressed in a brown overcoat, runs down the street, shoots Tresca twice at close range in full view of witnesses 
and then leaps into the waiting car that speeds off west in the direction of Chelsea. So he didn't miss he didn't miss the jump. This time. And it's it's interesting to me because Genovese used Galani. Galani, you think of him being more a banana guy. Yeah. And so he so he he does it from Sicily. So I don't think he had a direct line to Galani. So I'm thinking it's more likely. Genovese calls somebody back in New York. Somebody says, oh, he calls Anastasia. Yeah, I bet it's a Murder it. Incorporated kind of thing. That's probably it. And he's like, it's a high-profile hit. He don't want to use his organization. He goes to Galani. Yep. That makes sense. Because Anastasia had something to do with that payoff anyway, remember? Mm-hmm. So that's that's probably how that went down. It probably wasn't a direct favor from Genovese to Galani. It was a roundabout favor. Makes more sense. Upon an American invasion of Italy in World War II, Genovese quickly realizes who's running the show. Vito quickly contacts U.S. commanders and generously becomes an interpreter for them. New York Governor Charles Paletti, who's the first Italian-American governor in U.S. history, immediately proves that he can be bought off as he graciously accepts a 1938 Packard sedan from the philanthropic Vito. As an interpreter for the Allies, Genovese becomes one of the most trusted and valued employees in the Allied military government for occupied territories. Thing, Remember when I talked about the lawless years and they did that bogus Dutchman thing? Uh-huh. I think they took this and incorporated it because remember they were going to use guns that were being sold overseas and they're like, nobody's going to miss them for a month and all that. And it was a pretty elaborate thing they had going for something that was complete bullshit. And I think it was kind of borrowed... From the script, you know, it was kind of borrowed from these kind of circumstances and stuff. Also, you got to remember, as he's stealing guns and food and doing all this stuff and just getting rich, there's good old-fashioned American citizens back home that are growing victory gardens, that are sacrificing metal and all the, the luxuries to supplement the war effort. Meanwhile, all these assholes are just blatantly abusing stuff, getting rich and arming the underground yeah. factions. And in some cases, uh, supplying aid and comfort to our enemies. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And But that's, you know, the theme of war, it seems, over and over. I can just picture in a movie, though, a scene when they're dragging Mussolini's ass through the streets. <laughs> yeah. You can just, you can see uh, this guy kind of off on the sidewalk smoking a cigar. Yeah. As, as they're dragging him he and goes, his wife by. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> yeah. I knew that let me, guy. Let me call the Americans. <laughs> wonder what they did with that car. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I was going to say, it's kind of ironic because Mussolini ended up getting the death of a mobster anyway. Probably even worse. Oh. Than a mobster. I mean, didn't they, like, bury him and then they kind of dig him up again to do more stuff to him? I mean... I mean, These are Italians. They, they do hated it, this man. Yeah. yeah. I don't think there's a a cutoff to their this is enough. Yeah. And I got to say, as an Italian, it's not in our culture that we dig up people. And no, it's not. Like, I mean, that's just something you do when you get drunk or something. Yeah. You know? It's like, we ought to dig him up and <laughs> piss in his mouth, you know, which is why I want to be cremated, by the way. <laughs> Genovese, along with Cagliaro Vizzini, the most influential and powerful mom boss in post-World War II Sicily rapidly establishes a black market within the military, stealing flour, sugar, and food from local ports that are intended for Allied forces. The operation flows smoothly, with Vizzini's trucks loading all Italian diet commodities and shipping them toward Naples, where Genovese's distribution network is waiting. Of course, all the trucks are issued AMGOT passes and export papers, and even some corrupted American officials get in on the racket by supplying them with gasoline and extra trucks. According to Luke Monzelli, a lieutenant in the Carabinieri, truckloads of food supplies were shipped from Vizzini to Genovese, all accompanied by the proper documents which had been certified by men in authority, mafia members in the service of Vizzini and Genovese. Soon, Genovese is comfortably controlling more than half of all military food imports and making huge profits from the operation. Just when business is starting to boom in Naples, things are going south for Genovese back in New York. Ernest the Hawk Rupolo is still pressing forward in his decision to implicate Vito in the Bochia murder, being faced with a murder rap himself. In August 1944, U.S. military police apprehend Genovese upon discovering his black market trucking operation. When investigating his criminal background for the Criminal Investigation Division, here's a name. Agent Orange C. Dickey, 
stumbles upon Genovese's tie to the Bochia murder, but also finds that it's of little to no interest as far as the U.S. Army or federal government are concerned. Agent Orange. Come on, we're all adults here. <laughs> I think it's Orange. There's nothing <laughs> funny about Agent Orange Dickey. <laughs> Agent Orange Dickey. Now, his sister, Purple Hoo Hoo, had a much rougher go of it. <laughs> Following months and months of hurdles, Agent Dickey is finally able to arrange for Genovese to be exported back to New York to stand trial for the Bochia killing. As it turns out, Dickey is the second coming of Elliot Ness, unwilling to fall victim to Genovese's 250 grand bribe offer. Upon his arrival home, Vito transfers his black market operations in Italy over to Luciano, who has been deported from the United States, released from prison for his cooperation in the war effort. Lucky expanded operations to include cigarettes, and eventually heroin. There's Carmine. Carmine coming up. Yep, he's coming up. The next day on June 2nd, 1945, Vito Genovese is arraigned on murder charges for the Bochia crime. The case against Genovese is still heavily dependent on the testimony of Peter Latempa and another cooperating witness named Jerry Esposito. Latempa is being kept safe in police custody until the trial is to begin. What could go wrong? It turns out plenty, as the witness in custody complains of gallstone pains and is administered painkillers by the guards. He's later found dead in his cell. According to the autopsy report, Latempa has enough toxins in his stomach to kill eight horses. You know, he should have been a little suspicious of the guard's medicine. It was like uh, the size of a handball. <laughs> he had to take like seven or eight bites just to get it down. You know I, mean? I think he should have known. How do you take eight horse pills? Uh. Eight horse killing horse pills. <laughs> You gotta take this. It'll make you better. You serious? Yeah, you're gonna have to. He gives him a jug of water, like the size of a two gallon bucket. You're probably gonna need this to wash it down. But see, now, when I was reading it, part of me was wondering did he make up the shit about the gallstones because he wanted a suicide? But they're not gonna give him a couple aspirin. They're not gonna give him. Uh, but maybe when you say, I like, I'm having some gallstones. I think it goes like this. A guard comes in, he puts a pistol to his head, he says, open up, and he starts shoving these pills down his mouth. And he's like, you're either going to die this way or you're going to die with a bullet in your head. Either way, you're dead. That's tough. Yeah, that's, that's tough probably how it went down. But it's fun to think of him chomping on a handball-sized pill. Oh. You got it, that's fine. That is funny. <laughs> with their stash of witnesses running low, the prosecution scurries to locate Esposito. He's not hard to find, as he's found lying on a roadside in Norwood, New Jersey. It's unclear how he originally came to be at this random location, but what is clear is that he won't be able to testify, having been positively riddled by bullets. With their case dismantled, Genovese's murder charges are dismissed on June 10, 1946, the day Esposito's body is found. Judge Samuel Leibowitz sends Vito off with a heartwarming message. I cannot speak for the jury. But I believe that if there were even a shred of corroborating evidence, you would have been condemned to the chair. Okay, but wouldn't that be anybody that's, con if, if there's a shred of corroborating evidence, that yeah, it's like, that's another way of saying that you didn't really do it and we can't <laughs> prove it, you know? Just some showmanship from the judge. I'm not going to bust you for shoplifting, but if I had one shred of evidence or any stolen property, or if anything had been missing from that store, <laughs> you'd have gone down for shoplifting. It probably sounded good when he rehearsed it at night. His wife said it sounded stern, you know? Just, it sounds really good, come to bed. <laughs> yes, you're very stern. <laughs> Following his release in 1946, Genevieve quickly re-ups with the Luciano family. However, Costello and Moretti have grown quite fond of their newfound power positions and aren't yet ready to relinquish them. At the historic Havana conference of that year, Genovese, in a private meeting in Luciano's hotel suite, tries to take back control of the situation by suggesting that Lucky become the boss of bosses, while allowing Vito to run everything else. Luciano, whose trust in Genovese is not as strong as his trust in Costello, turns down the proposition. Luciano says, there is no boss of bosses. I turned it down in front of everybody. If I ever change my mind, I will take the title. But it won't be up to you. Right now you work for me, and I ain't in the mood to retire. Don't you ever let me hear this again, or I'll lose my temper. Undeterred, Vito Genovese begins to plan the dismantling of one Frank Costello. Costello is powerful, however, and protected by a literal army of hitmen. 
These hit men will have to be dealt with. First on the list is Willie Moretti. Willie Moretti is becoming a problem for the commission, having contracted syphilis that seems to be loosening up his tongue. It's it's the point of infection. <laughs> and when you, when I saw the script, I said, "Damn, we already used up all the Moretti jokes." <laughs> <laughs> Not even close. No, 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 no. Isn't that what took uh... Al Capone? Yeah. Yep. Sure did. And how come it's not funny when Capone gets syphilis, but it's a freaking laugh riot when it happens to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just luck of the draw. It's all in contrast. Oh, oh yeah. Genevieve sees this as an opportunity to get rid of him. He goes to the commission for the go-ahead on the Moretti hit, justifying it as a mercy killing. Yeah, that's basically what it was. And I, yeah, I think he was deteriorating fast. His mind was going and stuff, and it was... That's what happened to Capone. We can all feel good about it. I feel great. Worrying that the disease's effect on his brain will result in his talking to the media about family operations, the commission gives Genovese the nod on this one. Moretti is removed from the picture and assassinated on October 4th, 1951. The elimination of Moretti prompts Genovese to be promoted from a capo in the Greenwich Village crew to underboss of the Luciano family. If you recall from the Anastasia episode, Anastasia was actually kind of forced to play a role in this. But he borrowed Moretti's bodyguard and stuff and kind of helped set it up uh, begrudgingly, but he had his own problems, right? Yeah. But he has no idea that he's actually helping Genovese eliminate a team of hitmen and that he'll end up on the list. So in, in effect, uh, Anastasia is just... His own. He's set up himself, yeah. He's, he's just uh, crossed a few of his buddies off the list. Wanted to go back to Capone real quick because kind of touched on it last time. Al Capone, the syphilis just took his brain and just ravaged it. And he, like, didn't know who he was. He was, like, shitting himself. Like, he couldn't even carry out daily functions. And, like, there were feds outside his house to make sure he wasn't faking it. That dude was not faking it. Uh, He was not faking it. He didn't know his name. He didn't know his mother's name. He didn't know anything. Sounds like Alzheimer's. So, yeah, they think he had some kind of form of dementia, and I think that's what's going on already here. So maybe Genevieve saw, maybe he actually saw it as a mercy killing, you know. Well, he was also a hitman that was in his way and a protection for Costello. So yeah. I'm going to take the under on that. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's just, uh, Genevieve, for whatever reason, everything is going his way as he's making his move. You know, like when would he ever get permission on Anastasia? Yeah. Never. But then Anastasia, it's just like, as soon as he wants somebody to screw up, they screw up. Yep. He doesn't have to wait long. Like, it just seems like, uh, I don't want to say God's on his side, but, I mean, it's just like everything's going his Luck's way. Luck's on his side. Yeah. yeah. So the mercy killing was at least a good excuse. Yeah. yeah. And, and he's going to have a lot of good excuses. Yeah. Of. While his life at work is steadily improving, Vito's life at home is steadily declining. His wife, Anna, sues Vito for financial support in December 1952 and sets an unbelievable mob wife precedent by testifying against her husband in court. Predictably, the couple divorces in 1953, although Anna had moved out of their New Jersey home two years prior. Genevieve files a countersuit to Anna's $350 a week payment request on the grounds of desertion. It is rumored that she has been engaging in an affair with Stephen Franze, a mobster that Genevieve charged to taking care of Anna while he was away in Italy. It's possible that Steve misunderstood the assignment. (laughs) (laughs) He did an excellent job, apparently. Anna is an interesting character in this. For one thing, she seems complicit in the murder of her husband, right? And she goes with him. But at this point now, he's been away too long, and she's gotten into the club scenes and things like that. And she's, uh, like I said, she's in the mob. Like, she's running clubs with mobsters and with this guy, Francais. They're getting into things and stuff. But the uh, controversial part is she's running gay clubs and drag clubs. And this is a long time ago. Like, it's not like we think about today. Yeah. You get involved in something like this. They talk about um, persecution, you know, and systematic persecution. This was systematic persecution. Yeah. If you're running a drag club, they will shut your bar down. They will raid you. They will arrest people. For being gay, for being dressed as a woman, they'll take away your liquor license, and it's all on the up and up. Like, these people had it hard. And she's, like, really putting herself out there and running these things. She owned uh, Club 82 and a few others. 
The Club 82 was a drag club that had the tagline, Who's No Lady? She was big into that. But weren't there rumors, though, that she was bisexual? She was. She had a lover. and She, yep. was, she was a little gay. And, uh, she had a lover for a long time. Right. Yeah. So all this is going on. And I believe, like, the reason she's flipping on her husband, I get a lot of this now. Somehow I'm the, the authority on who's a rat and who's not a rat, right? Because <laughs> you hate so, rats. So the big question, it. is Anna a rat? <sighs> Okay, I'll make it easy. She's a rat, okay? She's in the <laughs> mob. Everybody is a rat. Everybody is a rat. <laughs> okay. It, it, she's a rat too, but I'm gonna give her I'm gonna give her this. All right. I think they leveraged her lifestyle and stuff, which would be used to destroy her. And I think they took her on that and they're like, We're gonna make you the public spectacle of, of gay and all this stuff. And and I think they leveraged that against her, and that's why she was so vigilant about all these things. Because you'll notice she never pinned him for the murder of her husband. Yeah. Right? And if you want to take him down, if you just hate him. That's what you that's would what do. You'll do yeah. And so she gave him a lot of stuff, but it Even was also she orchestrated it. Yeah, and it meant a lot of it's the least of what he did. It's true, you know. And but the the problem's getting where she's mentioning other guys like Frank Costello. And she stuff. didn't mention Bochia, you know. She didn't mention no. Any other she deaths, didn't mention yeah. the things that would unilaterally put him down, put him away. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, I think she was forced to do what she did. And she didn't fall on her sword, you know what I mean? Much like uh, Virginia Hill with Bugsy mm-hmm. and stuff. Like Virginia Hill's not a rat, obviously. Yeah. They get leveraged in a way that you can almost see why they made the decision they made. And I don't think it was entirely her doing. Also, there's an interesting story. Like As Frank Castillo starts to come into this, he needs her to shut up or get on his side. But he pays this lady, she's a reporter named Dorothy Kilgallen, and she's a syndicated newspaper columnist at the time of the trial, right? And he buys her something like a diamond pendant or a diamond cross, and uh, basically she's paid off. And what he's doing is he's sending messages to Anna through the newspaper media, and she's saying things like, if I were Mrs. Vito Genovese, I'd be awful careful crossing the streets, you know? And it's just like, can you imagine, like, you're using Tucker Carlson to, yeah. to threaten somebody, in, you know, in, that's in witness protection and yeah. stuff? And, like, it's amazing because we're all living our stupid lives, and like they say, there's these guys that are really deciding what's going on and you're home watching the news thinking you're just watching a news clip you're watching a reporter send a mob message put to out a hit on yes it. To, to shut your mouth and get your get your shit straight it's a it's a fascinating time in american history and anna genovese basically doubles down in court claiming that her ex-husband controls the numbers rackets in the city and rakes in more than one million yearly She also implicates him in owning numerous Greenwich Village nightclubs and a dog racing track in Virginia. Anna's claims prove to be futile, however, as the New Jersey Superior Court Appellate Division dismisses them in 1954. As a natural matter, of course, Genovese orders the murder of Franze. The job goes to Joe Valachi, who will later be the first man to publicly acknowledge the mob's existence in court to take out Loverboy Steven. Valachi, luring Franzi to his restaurant in the Bronx, watches on as Anna's lover is strangled to death by Pasquale Pagano and Valachi's nephew, Fiore Ciano. By the time the 50s roll around, Vito Genovese has had enough of Frank Costello. In order to move in on him, however, he'll first have to deal with Albert Anastasia, a staunch ally of Costello's on the commission. Genovese concocts a plan to remove Albert by corrupting Anastasia's underboss, Carlo Gambino. Genovese convinces Gambino that his future would be brighter in a post-Anastasia world, and Gambino agrees. 1957 proves to be a busy year for Genovese and company. Early in the year, Genovese oversees his plan against Costello go into motion. Vincent Giganti, a future boss of the family, is ordered to kill Costello. On May 2, 1957, Giganti shoots and seriously wounds Costello just outside his apartment complex. Although not dead... Frank gets the message and kindly steps aside for the retired life. So we kind of covered this in the Anastasia episode. Costello was on the alliance side of Anastasia and these guys. So it's Costello, Anastasia, the now dead uh, Morelli. They're on one side and Genovese is on the other side. So this is part of the systematic elimination. Let's go back and we'll hear that. It's 1957 and the hit on Frank Costello is underway. 
The would-be assassin Vincent Giganti, a young up-and-comer eager to make a name for himself, is assigned the task. The hit is to take place in the lobby of his Manhattan apartment as he is getting on the elevator. The window of opportunity is tight, and he must move quickly or lose his target behind the closing doors of the elevator. Perhaps to slow him down, or just out of brazen overconfidence, Giganti shouts, Frank Costello! This is for you! Wow, man, when you said this is for you, it's like I was there in the lobby. It, it, it's like I, I ducked yeah. when, when, you, when you shouted that. That was crazy. But what you got to remember is, uh, A, he didn't get him, right? Yeah, he, he missed didn't him. Get him. Yep. And uh, you think that would be the end of the chin, but he's, he's on his way to bigger things. And like we've said before, the mob is the home of second chances. Like things you think would end your career don't. And in his defense... He didn't miss him entirely. Like, I've seen a lot of things where the, he just missed, or did he miss on purpose? And I'm like, he didn't freaking miss. The bullet grazed and bounced off Costello's skull. Yeah. And that's going to leave one hell of a thing. My mom used to say, nothing bleeds like a head wound. You know, so you take that bullet and it rips across your bone. <laughs> she would know. <laughs> yeah, and your scalp will just bleed. Yeah. Uh, so when he saw him, he looked like he was dead. He looked like he got it in the head and stuff. Now, when they're going through this, and uh, Gigani is the, uh, he's a former prize fighter. They call him the Chin, and he's a driver for Costello. So they start watching his habits and stuff. And the first thing they notice is like all the guys in Costello's position, and Costello is big. They walk around with bodyguards, armored cars, and they're, they're careful, right? He doesn't do any of that. He's still going to the store, walking down the street like, like it's nothing. And, he, and the point we made in the Galani episode is the worst money you can spend as a bodyguard, that's the first guy they're going to pay off. That's exactly right. And here you go. It's yeah. his driver that took the shot. Oh, the other thing we got to remember he did not have permission to shoot Costello. No, he did not. He had the no. opposite of permission to <laughs> do shoot Costello. Do not do this. Yeah, so he <laughs> just tried to take out a boss. And uh, there's going to be consequences for this. Yeah. So this is something he's got to deal with. Giganti is almost implicated in the crime when a doorman identifies him as the shooter, but is bailed out when Costello steps in and says he did not know his would-be killer. Vito Genovese is now the boss of the newly christened Genovese crime family. Later that year, it's Anastasia's turn to get the axe. At one point, getting the approval of an Anastasia execution would be impossible. But Anastasia's recent loose cannon behavior has made the decision quite agreeable to the commission. While at the Park Central Hotel Barbershop in Manhattan, Anastasia is viciously gunned down in full view of fellow patrons. We know about that. Yes, sir. It went a little something like this. The barber shop has two entrances. One is from a corridor off the 55th Street side of the hotel, and it's connected to the shop by a small foyer. The other entrance is from the hotel lobby. The gunmen open the door from the lobby, walk around a partition which screens the shop's chairs from the entrance, and head directly to chair number four. They're at Anastasia's back. The notorious killer has made a classic mistake by leaving his back to a door. One gunman is about five foot eight, the other about five foot five. Both wear fedoras. Both don dark aviator type sunglasses. One man strides to the left of Anastasia and pushes aside the barber with the muzzle of his gun. The other killer moves to Anastasia's right. Both begin shooting. Anastasia, relaxed and reclined, is suddenly in a hail of gunfire. His quiet meditation is severed by the stinging penetration of hot lead into his arms and chest. The assassins fire repeatedly into his chair. He scarcely has time to comprehend what is happening, but his adrenaline and his animal instincts kick in. He manages to uncover his face and seize the shapes of his attackers. Even in this moment of shock and surprise, Anastasia knows he must act and act fast. He lunges like a wounded bear at his assailants. Unfortunately, in his haste and confusion, Anastasia attacks the reflection of his assailants in a large barber mirror. Mildly bemused and pleasantly surprised, the killers continue their assault. He raises his left hand protectively. Two slugs rip through it, the gun so close that it leaves powder burns on his palm. The third bullet tears into his hip. Still encumbered by the hot towels, Anastasia stumbles toward chair number three. The fourth bullet crashes in the back of his head. The fifth slug hits his back. Anastasia falls dead on his back between chairs two and three. In November 1957, Genevieve seeks recognition and legitimization by holding a national Cosa Nostra meeting. Stefano the Undertaker Magadino, a boss in Buffalo, is chosen to oversee the arrangements. The Undertaker, however, transfers his duties to Pennsylvania boss Joseph Barbera and his underboss Russell Buffalino. 
At what becomes known as the Appalachian Meeting, the crime lords discuss the gambling and drug smuggling aspects of the Manhattan Island. Edgar D. Croswell, a New York State trooper, becomes increasingly aware that something unusual is going down at the Barbera residence. When Barbera's son is rapidly reserving rooms in local hotels around town, Croswell gets even more suspicious. So Croswell apparently calls for backup. And uh, for being back then, they seem to have a pretty good network and stuff. And he's like, send me everyone you got, right? And they send like 50 state troopers over there. So, I mean, they surround this place. The other thing you got to remember is the real reason for this meeting is because he took a shot at a boss. He's in trouble, right? So he's going to like have this big meeting and try to like patch everything up. That's a big part of what's going on here. He's going to explain how he's justified in doing what he did and stuff. So then there's other things going on like... 30 pounds of three different kinds of meat are being ordered. There's all this food. I mean, it's a, it's a crazy thing going on. And this is a small little town. Yeah. So and this whole thing is stupid, right? And uh, it, it kind of mirrors what we just saw happen in Sicily, you know, when they raided that and took down all these guys. Yeah. But this is the reason. This is the reason that nobody does this anymore. State police, upon discovering multiple lines of luxury cars parked outside Barbera's home, gradually set up a roadblock after many of the license plates come back with wanted criminals as the owners of the vehicles. It's unclear who looked out the window and saw the blockade first, but pretty soon, mobsters of all shapes and sizes are rushing to flee the scene on foot and by car. So they're raiding it like a high school drunk party, you know, like they're actually like in silk suits and they're all hauling ass into the woods and stuff. <laughs> it reminds me of, do you see the Sopranos when Johnny Sack's place got busted yep. and Tony just inexplicably runs into the woods and then they show him with like one shoe on showing up at his house. That's what it's like. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. <laughs> and one guy actually runs to this run down farmhouse. And uh, when the cops are getting close, he just stands on the porch, leaning on a post like he lives there. But he's in this Italian, you know, thousand dollar suit. And he's just standing on this rickety old hillbilly porch <laughs> like like nothing's wrong. <laughs> you know, so they don't go for it. They bust him. Weird. <laughs> Smartly, Russell Buffalino decides to use some reverse psychology on the troopers by attempting to avoid their roadblock using his car. Shockingly, it doesn't work. Police stop the car, seeing that Buffalino is accompanied by Genovese and three others. Out of options, Buffalino claims they've come to visit their gravely ill friend Barbara. Genovese claims they're simply in town for a barbecue and business talks. Believe it or not, the cops are convinced, and Buffalino and company are let go. Now, uh, you remember Buffalino just got played by Joe Pesci in The yeah, Irishman. Brilliantly played by yeah, Joe yeah. Pesci. I heard an interview with Orlando Spado, and he said he played him to a T. You know, he's like, he did a great job of course and stuff. He did. But after everybody gets busted, right, somehow the word gets out that this is the, the bullshit line that worked, right? So now all of a sudden, 50 guys are trying to say that they're there for a sick friend and stuff, but the line's been used up. You uh -huh. know what I mean? It's really pathetic. And they're like, I'm here for a sick friend. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. No. Uh, yeah, so this, this worked for these guys, but everybody else, it's, it's not working and stuff. Guess who they blame for this? Who? Vito Genovese, uh. who calls this freaking meeting, which is actually not supposed to happen. They've already had a meeting. Remember, they just had one a year before. Right. You don't have a meeting like this for five years. But he pulls his weight, and he's going to, like, be the king he shit. got to be here. He, he basically... Have a good spread. <laughs> exactly. And they, they are not happy with him for this. In a June 1958 testimony in what is now known as the Valachi hearings, Genovese cites his Fifth Amendment right 150 times. Yeah, and we thought, like, Tony Ducks with 120 times, here's 30 more than... Yeah, you're right, but this kind of sets the precedent for what works. Right. right? Like, this is what you do to get out of trouble. You yep. get, like, Frank Costello running his mouth and trying to play the nice guy, and it, it hung him out to dry. Think about what Rico would have done here. Oh, All God, guys. man, All those Rico would have been... Yeah. Yeah, it would have been a gold mine. Yeah. In July, Genovese is handed charges of conspiring to import and sell narcotics after Luciano pays a Puerto Rican drug dealer $100,000 to implicate Vito in a deal. On April 4th of the following year, Genovese is convicted of conspiracy to violate federal narcotics laws. On April 17th, 1959, 
Vito Genovese is sentenced to 15 years in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. However, this doesn't stop him from trying to run the family from the inside. So this is based almost exclusively on the testimony of Nelson Conte Yeeps, right? And this is no accident. What happens is they want to get rid of Genovese now, Luciano and Costello. So Luciano and Costello, they want to get rid of Genovese without killing him if they can. Yeah. So they set him up on this drug deal with the help of Carlo Gambino. Ah. Right? And Gambino's supposed to be helping Genovese get rid of Costello and Anastasia, but he's an opportunist. So he tells Genovese that he's got this great drug deal going and blah, blah, blah with this guy. Now, Genovese has a strict rule about not dealing drugs, but he figures it doesn't apply to him. And it's just part of the overall hypocrisy of, of mob life. So they set him up. He's like, hey, I got this great deal and everything. And the $100,000, $50,000 was put up by Gambino. $50,000 was put up by Luciano and Costello. Mm. And that's how that goes down. I forgot, too, Lansky was in on this deal. Of course. Yeah, Lansky, Costello were working with uh, the approval of Luciano. Old Meyer. Over the next several years, Genevieve orders a mix of revenge and retribution killings, aiming his finger at Anthony Carfano, who skipped the ill-fated meeting, Anthony Strollo, because he was convinced Strollo helped put him away, and Ernest the Hawk Rapolo. Genevieve also places a $100,000 bounty on Valachi's head. So now he's uh, in jail, and he's starting to deteriorate. He's got mental problems. They say he's extremely paranoid and stuff. Strollo did nothing wrong. <laughs> but he thinks everybody sabotaged him, everybody's against him and stuff. And some people were against him, not these guys. He's looking at his immediate guys going, like, who did me wrong, you know. And it, it was Luciano, it was Costello, it was Lansky and these guys. Like, he's 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 done now. Yeah. <laughs> he's got no, he can't see the big picture, which really is kind of his thing. Like I always say, if these guys stay in their lane, you know what I mean? Never happens. Yeah. On February 14, 1969, Vito Genovese dies of a heart attack at the United States Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Missouri. Genovese's funeral begins in the family hometown, Red Bank, New Jersey. Genovese's bronze coffin was transported from the funeral home in Red Bank to his church. A sparsely attended funeral mass was celebrated February 17th at St. Agnes Roman Catholic Church in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey, the location of Genovese's more recent home. Genovese was buried at St. John's Cemetery in Middle Village, Queens, New York. The burial was attended only by family and close friends. This concludes the legend of Vito Genovese. So this is the end of Vito Genovese, but it's also the beginning of the end for the mob. After the, the big raid, and then these trials, and then you've got Valachi, who's the first big-time rat. He actually is the one that names Cosa Nostra in retaliation for the hit that Genovese puts on him. So Genovese has really just pulled the bottom row out of a house of cards. Mm -hmm. Like, didn't you know what he did? And uh, they were saying that after uh, Valachi, there were no more secrets in the mob and stuff, and that uh, Valachi spilled his guts and basically said every single thing he knew. Not exactly true. Valachi had a mistress that nobody knew about, so nah. when he dies, her name's Marie Jackson. Seemingly comes out of nowhere, but... Uh, he dies, leaves nothing to his wife and kids and stuff. He leaves all the money to this lady, wow. named Marie Jackson, right? So, uh, which isn't a ton. I mean, he had the Valachi paper, book royalties and things like that. And uh, in 1972, the same year The Godfather was released, uh, Dino De Laurenti turned out the Valachi papers into a film, and it starred Charles Bronson. Oh, so I don't time. know if she got money from that, but there were the book deals and things like that. So she ended up with a decent chunk of change. And uh, at the end, she was, I think she did her last interview in 1995, kind of just on a goof. And she spoke uh, of, of the royalties and things like that. They were buried together. And I think for a long time, it was an unmarked grave. So people couldn't, you know, yeah, do what they do. Understand. She ends up being buried with him and stuff. Uh, Anna lived a long time. She died in 1982 and was buried next to her husband. Next to Vito. Yeah. Wow. Who, who never put a hit out on her, which just adds my belief that... Uh, I, don't, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. When you're dead, maybe you don't have a choice. They just carry you to the hole and drop you in, and that's where you're buried. Yeah. Maybe it was already... Uh, 
It was already paid for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They'd already dug it. We can't get our money back. It's New York, man. The rent was cheap. <laughs> Maybe it was a family choice, but even then, I don't know why they would, uh, you know. But it's back to her being uh, marginalized by the government. Yeah. You know, but maybe the whole thing was, because why wouldn't they kill her for what she did? Mm -hmm. They didn't. You know what I mean? So I think... So he must have said no. He had to have said don't. don't." Yeah. Because he's the only one that could have stopped it. Because did they have kids? They had to have had kids together, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... And I think she did at least have the uh, benefit of dying with her lover present. Yeah. She was there when she died and stuff. But, uh... I just, I don't know, the whole thing makes me think, like, Costello could have killed her. He still had uh, things to lose. People with things to lose could have killed her. They yeah. didn't. So I really think they, it was understood why she did what she did, and she did minimally what she had to. That's just kind of my impression of it. Before we wrap it up, I just want to give a shout-out to the Emerita Social Club on Instagram. If you haven't uh, checked out their profile, check it out. They put a ton of interesting stuff, uh, not just pictures and stuff, but they have long explanations and stories and everything. And uh, anytime I can, I try to take notes. And uh, I know my phone is full of stuff I've saved from them and stuff. So give them a a shout-out. They're they're great people. So, uh, Joshua, got anything else to say? Make sure to buy Ori Spado's new book, The Accidental Gangster. And uh, have a good night. Thank you for listening to Partners in Crime. This week's episode is an adaptation of several different historical accounts. Music is courtesy of Kevin McLeod. All sources and attribute links can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Partners in Crime Podcast. Links are in the show notes. If you didn't like the show, keep your mouth shut. No one likes a rat. <laughs>